We're excited to also have Dr. Panuto from Buffalo State, who's been working on gobies here in the lake for 15 years, 12 <laughs> years, for quite a while. A bunch of you saw a lot of folks referencing his work and done some of the great foundational stuff to help us understand this fish's role in these lakes. Thanks, Brian. Um, well, as a kind of a uh, follow-up to what some of the things that Ed was talking about, part of what I'll show you today um, is a spin-off of that workshop that he mentioned that occurred over in Michigan. And my, uh, my co-author here, uh, Dr. Beeler, uh, is the one who attended that workshop. <clears throat> the reason he went there was to, was to sort of suggest that um, in addition to the historical trawl data that we typically do, um, to do some of the near-shore complex habitat stuff, the, the video work would be a nice complement to some of the trawl data. <clears throat> and I want to uh, show you a little bit about uh, some of that today. Uh, so uh, there's always been this um, uh, uh, idea about the Gobi migration near-shore offshore. <clears throat> if you go back and look at the, the European literature, uh, it's pretty uh, clear. This is what these fish do. They head off in the wintertime and come back in the spring. In fact, there are um, uh, fishing uh, uh, industries for boats. They, uh, they uh, gill net them during this migration period. And you can, you can even go to some of the ethnic rest, uh, stores here in, in Buffalo and purchase gobies in tomato sauce. I wouldn't recommend that you eat those. <laughs> uh, it's really not very good stuff. But, but the fact is that people have taken advantage of this out-migration, in-migration to collect all these as a potential food source. So we wanted to also um, try and take a, look, take a look at this. So um, migrations are pretty phenomenal things. Right? Uh, they, you know, your old ecology background. And uh, we have lots of examples of, of large migrations of animals. Uh, here we have some mammals. Uh, these, you know, of course, are uh, African plains mammals uh, migrating in huge amounts. So huge abundances of these. Animals. And of course, animal like this moving across the landscape is consuming food and leaving uh, waste products behind. So this is a, uh, a mass of animals that have some real implications for biogen chemistry, for nutrient flux and nutrient movements. <coughs> moving up a little bit, uh, I mean, we're moving on a little bit. We also have uh, birds, lots of examples of mass migrations of birds. Uh, anybody who's been on a golf course or Waterfront beach or a, or, a, or a park after a bunch of Canadians are in there, you know there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, fecal material behind, right? Uh, but I mean Canada, Canada geese, I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're not here to talk about mammals, uh, nor are we here to talk about birds. Uh, we're here to talk about fish, right? And a um, great example, right? One of the most well studied. Um, examples of how fish are involved in a mass movement of nutrients from one ecosystem to another. This whole story of marine derived nutrients, right? You're probably familiar with this, where salmon acquire all these nutrients while they're growing out in the ocean, return to their natal um, spawning streams, and, and leave behind all these um, nutrients that are of great value. And we can follow those nutrients, right? And find them in the in-stream primary production, uh, in the algae that's growing in there, in the secondary production of insects. In the riparian trees, we can find signatures of these nutrients. And of course, lots of other large mammals that are coming and going from this tree. So animals moving nutrients around the landscape is a, is a pretty important phenomenon in our world. So uh, long ago, when I started working with gobies, uh, I'm actually a stream ecologist. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm watching these animals in streams. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I'll show you some data here in a second. They're blowing in the winter time. I just can't catch them anymore. Um, so it started me thinking a little bit about this kind of uh, mass movement of animals, um, and whether it might be something similar to marine-derived nutrients put in, in the first. So clearly, um, gobies have become uh, a very important <coughs> prey item across the Great Lakes. This is some data uh, from Michigan. And of course, somebody, uh, you've already heard the, about the decline in the prey base in Michigan. <coughs> but the, uh, the kind of interesting thing is um, noticing that the gobies <coughs> are making up a larger proportion of that. Uh, I think the last uh, the year here was 2014, where gobies finally surpassed eelwise in terms of biomass <coughs> in the uh, So I think it's the case also for, for maybe for Huron, but the folks in, in Lake Michigan, again, right, they're, they're wondering how do we start managing for gobies. Right? It's become such an important prey item. <coughs> um, I've had discussions with you, but actually, I think it's a little bit of a, of a slippery slope, right? We certainly have uh, state regulations and we have federal regulations, things like that. Here in New York, if you catch a goat, you're supposed to destroy this animal. It's an invasive species. It's, uh, 
it was on the uh, prohibited tax on this and things like that. And you know, to how do we actually make the decision when we're going to um, you know, manage for slash support an invasive species and when do we want to try and remove it? And of course, I think we're in a situation now where, like many invasives, once they've got a good strong foothold, it's nearly impossible to eliminate them. So you have, as uh, Dave Jude and others uh, say, you make lemonade, right? So anyway, they're, they're clearly important. Uh, we've seen this, this graph already too, also in, in Lake Ontario, again, our, our long-term trawl data, great uh, indication that you know, these, these animals um, are doing quite well. We have a lot of them in the lake. Uh, again, you see, you see the little pattern. But again, uh, one of the most important um, prey items in terms of numbers, I think just behind the wise in terms of, of uh, the number of fish that we find down there. So again, reason, reason to try and investigate what these fish do. So as I mentioned, um, the early literature from Europe suggested that these fish do uh, inshore offshore migration. When I started working on these in streams, uh, we would electroshock every month from the mouth of, uh, of many streams that we have entering Lake Erie. And sure enough, by um, December and January, we're just not able to find any fish. And then they'd show up again in maybe March or April. Uh, so again, I got us thinking about what to, um, what are, these, what are these fish doing? So part of what I wanted to do um, uh, in this project with, with uh, Canute is uh, really just see if, if in fact we can, if the fish are really, really, are they thinking uh, this side? So what we did is we um, did some sampling with the uh, underwater video just to really understand a little bit better, do the fish really move offshore or do they move out of our study site? <clears throat> um, so, so do some uh, seasonal, uh, assessments of the abundance of turtles. And um, uh, knowing that these fish seem to have, uh, depending on, on lake, a, a very strong ontogenetic shift in what they are consuming from uh, benthic and invertebrous kind of fish to molluscal um, that's around seven centimeters, um, depending on, on the lake you're in. Um, what's the size distribution of these fish uh, as they're and what's hitting offshore. Similarly, the, the size distribution gives us some, some idea of the kinds of uh, potential prey that are available to uh, larger parts of it. And then, um, to take it a little bit further, uh, take it a little bit about the importance of these fish in lake nutrient budgets. Um, we, we did something similar to this in Lake Erie, looking at <coughs> um, just sort of nutrient mass balance ideas to see how important or how much the quantity of nutrients locked up in different compartments of the, of the biota, um, and just to see if that might be important. So I'll do some back of the envelope calculations here to, to think about the, the phosphorus that gobies are moving around in, in the lake. So you've seen that. So here's our study. So I work in the Lower Niagara River for this. So, so this is again a spin-off of the sturgeon work that um, uh, Dimitri's been doing and, and Canute's been involved with. <coughs> Uh, but we, uh, we sampled a part of the Lower River, and then this, this uh, near shore zone in Lake Ontario, uh, just a little bit uh, adjacent to what others have called the, the sandbar or the bar in the Lower Niagara. So we're about 1 to 12 meters deep between all the sites. Collectively, we just call this the near shore. And uh, we're going to sample this twice, once in the middle of August, the water's pretty warm, and then again in the, uh, November after the water temperatures have uh, cooled down quite a bit. We're going to use underwater video. Um, very simple setup here. It's a GoPro camera mounted on a little pyramid shaped frame. Um, it's lower to the bottom and um, it sits there and records for 10 minutes at a site. Then what we'll do, <laughs> this picture just won't go away, will it? Uh, uh, so we'll uh, have this 10 minute video. So then what we'll do is um, uh, we'll clip it at, at, at the every minute marker for a still image. Um, we discard the first five minutes uh, for an acclimation period. These are unbaited. Um, and then uh, we'll count the number of gobies at every screenshot in the last five minutes. And then, so those are sort of uh, five uh, replicate counts. Now, when we first started doing video a while ago, years ago, we were really concerned because as divers we knew that uh, when we went to the bottom, <clears throat> could really attract gobies when 
um, you stir up the bottom. They're really, they're really curious little fish. So what we do in, in, in an underwater video like this is we, um, we compare the first five minute count to the last five minute count, um, just to see if they're the same number of fish that we see. And it sort of gives us some inferences whether we're attracting or, or frightening fish. And in all cases, we always find that the counts we do are, are really pretty, pretty consistent across our five minute interval. So in this case, there are, I think, six gobies in this picture. Um, and the nice thing about this, this simple technique, we have a little grid and um, our little marker there. You can see it's almost two centimeters. And we end up with you know, all these fish here. So we can, um, of course, count the fish. We we'll do size frequency distributions. And then with um, regressions, we can do biomass. Um, once we have the biomass and we have a, a known um, <coughs> value for a nutrient content, we can then start scaling up to um, nutrient abundances. So, so that's what I'm going to show you. Okay, so our first um, August sampling, um, we're looking at uh, the lake and the river, and nearly all of our, our videos were usable. Uh, what we found, of course, is that we weren't, we weren't looking at the bottom before we threw our, our sampler over, so sometimes we threw in a, in a very dense weed bed. So we had a, a small proportion, or a proportion that were just un unusable because it was just too dense with uh, vegetation to see anything. So we had, pretty, again, pretty results. Um, no real difference in the counts between the river and the lake, um, but you can see the number. Um, if, you, if you recall some of the trawl data slides you saw before, some of those peak values um, were uh, about 1,500 per hectare. Um, we did this technique uh, a number of years ago in Lake Ontario, 2008, and we were getting numbers around 46,000 per hectare in the near shore. Um, the, the Lake Ontario data I just showed you again is about 1,500 was the, the peak abundance for some of those numbers. And in this particular study, on, about on average, we're looking at about 200,000 <coughs> um, fish per hectare. Uh, it's a very large number, <coughs> right? Um, oh, um, so, so. Uh, no difference in, in the lake and the river, and um, dramatic differences between August and November. And let's see if we'll get this thing to you. Let's see, how am I going to click on that? That's what I was wondering too. I saw you had the videos back at there. Come on, baby. Um, so again, I got a couple of just little video clips here. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Oh, it's showing on the yeah. screen. Here. Okay, everybody gather around. <laughs> oh my God. So, well, if you can. So, what you're going to see over here, right now in August, uh, this is the same uh, same location. So, this is a, one of our, I believe it's a 12 meter site. 12 meter site. Um, and, um, you know, again, you wouldn't see just fish are moving all over the place. Um, and,. The nice thing about this particular, um, using this technique is that, you know, when you start the video, uh, you can actually see fish that are, that are quite small. Sorry. But that's okay. Um, and to, uh, to, to give you the punchline, of course, uh, find lots and lots and lots of fish in this August sample. Uh, and, so, and really just, as, in the whole video, so I think I have 30-minute clip on both sides. <clears throat> and um, the clip on the right, oh, here we go. Oh, quite dark, but um, oh, here we go. All right, oh, here's monster boat coming. <laughs> but this one particular rock has got has got four fish sitting on it, um, and of course you can just see the fish moving. And this is it. people who you know are out in, in Gobi Land. You see this all the time. Right? Very very high abundance of fish, and they're constantly just kind of moving around. Um, maybe you, sometimes you can see what you're thinking with the same fish leave and come back after you watch it for a while. But again, quite a number of fish. The other nice thing about a simple technique like this, as I'll show you, of course we can measure their lengths, but we also get a nice snapshot of the substrate conditions. Um, so you can see what the heck uh, types of substrates they're, they're uh, inhabiting and we can make comparisons with that. Let's go ahead and show you another one. It's in the folder, just should be able to just have to click it. So, yep. Okay, so then we went back to the same sites in November. 
And this is what, this is what you see. Here's the one guy. This, one's kind of, this little guy here is going to just kind of scoot across the screen. But, uh, the point is where um, historic water temperatures um, in the high teens, or, or low 20s, uh, C, 20, 23, 20, 23 degrees Celsius. We're, and here we're down about 6 degrees Celsius. And really, um, the, the fish are just absent. I had a colleague once that said, well, maybe they just burrow into the mud. They're, you know, they're actually not swimming offshore. And I, I suppose that's possible, but again, uh, it's, it's difficult to catch them in our, our streams. So, uh, but I think in addition to the, the trawl data that suggests that they really are showing up in greater numbers offshore, um, I think it's a pretty good indication that these animals really are moving, moving away. So what are they like? Um, yeah, you're good. Thank you. That's where I was There you go. Okay, there you go. Starting back up. You're doing great. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, so again, from those videos, we can, we can get some size distributions. And of course, uh, when you look at the trawl data, you'll see a lot of these kinds of fish out here. And of course, in the video, we can pick up these, these much smaller uh, animals. So again, having the size distribution, uh, we, can, we can convert that to biomass uh, using some regressions that we have, uh, pull down the value from the literature on the uh, mass of phosphorus per gram of goby tissue from uh, a paper from Lake Erie. Uh, some previous work we did, we have you know, maps of the Lake Erie, uh, Lake, Lake Ontario near shore. So the zero to 20 meter contour on the U.S. side of the lake is about 32,000 square hectares. Um, so we take the number of fish, their mass, the amount of phosphorus per fish, we scale it up. We, we come up with this, uh, this value of about 41 uh, metric tons of phosphorus locked up in Gobi tissue on the U.S. side of, of, the, of the lake. Um, Again, we can go back and look at what the tributary contributions of phosphorus are, what the annual loads are. And this is about 3% of the annual phosphorus load of the lake. Um, I think this is kind of significant in the sense that you know, now you've got this large amount of phosphorus moving to the offshore areas of the lake in a shorter, short time period. And uh, again, of course, the question become, is this, is this a significant maybe new source of phosphorus to the lake that we didn't see before um, that makes its way offshore. Now, of course, this is all phosphorus in the tissue. Right? So this is either, these fish have to be either consumed or uh, excrete phosphorus to, to move all that pee and leave it behind. But, but the point is, I think we might be looking at something that could be a significant um, nutrient source. OK, um, so again, a lot of benefits from using the the video, we can do presence, absence, density numbers, we can calculate up to these um, length and biomass and energy, diversity of other fishes, we can see other fishes sometimes, and we can get this um, information on substrate composition. Limitations, water still has to be clear. You've got to be able to see it. <coughs> video or still, uh, don't put an uh, artificial light source, they'll, they're somewhat attracted to that. I so also wouldn't recommend baiting just because that will attract them, you inflate your numbers. Uh, and of course, something as simple as keeping a little scale in there so you can measure things later on. <laughs> Again, okay, so in inclusion, um, really these fish were gone by, by our late um, uh, season sampling. Hyperabundant in August. Again, uh, about 200,000 per square hectare, or per hectare, 20 per square meter. As I mentioned, about 4,100 tons of phosphorus, about 3% of the annual and um, just some, some acknowledgments uh, that Lower Niagara River is a tough place to work. Um, <laughs> we've got great uh, people taking care of us um, at the Great Lake Center, getting us out on the boat in a, in a safe manner. Um, also, the Western North Prison uh, is an office uh, for invasive species management. And they help a lot thinking about outreach and getting information like this out to the public. And that's a fun Great. Thank you.